away my sin and nothing but the blood of Christ. tired of singing about the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so I'm grateful. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for choosing Bethany Baptist Church to be at. If you're a guest, welcome. We're grateful that you're here. And we're going to start our service with uh, reading some scripture out of the book of Psalm chapter 145, starting in verse number eight, where the Bible says, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Amen. I'm so thankful that you chose to be here, and, and we're going to sing praises to our great God today, and so you might as well, you're here, you might as well, it's warm in here, it feels good, you might as well just get involved, and fortunately today we have the group, uh, tour group from West Coast Baptist College, and we're looking forward to them singing for us just after I pray, and so if you would bow with me, and we'll get our service started with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for being here with us. Uh, where two or three are gathered together, you're in the midst and so, God, we need you this morning. We need you to speak to our hearts. Uh, but also, Lord, we want to just take this time to sing praises to you and give you the glory that you deserve. We're so thankful, Lord, for the salvation you've given to us. And if there's someone here today that they don't know that for sure, I pray, God, that today would be the day of their salvation. They'd get it settled in their hearts. And, Father, we pray your blessings on each and every aspect of today. And we'll be sure to give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Coast Baptist College. My name is Brandon Bartlett. I'm a junior from Windsor, Colorado, and I'm studying church ministries. Hello, my name is Mallory Bacon. I'm from Arlington, Texas, and I'm a senior studying elementary education. Hello, everyone. 
at the piano is Michael Kearney. He and his family are missionaries to Ghana, West Africa. He is a senior and he is studying music education. Simple. 
Stand and sing page number 245, Wonderful Story of Love. God sent his son down to die on an old rugged cross is the most wonderful love story ever written. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it is our greatest desire that before the day is over that you would come to know him. And if you do know him, that you would take that story and you would tell others about it. So thankful you're here today. We have some guests that are in our congregation. We're very thankful for that. And you're always welcome at Bethany Baptist Church. And if we can do anything or answer any questions for you today, please let us do so. And we want to be a church family to you and for you if you would allow us. So good, as have already been said, to have the group here and from West Coast, the Revival Trio singing. They're going to sing again a couple more songs before the message. And I just want to personally thank these, these four young people for their willingness to be here. And you may not realize it, but while all the other college students are at home spending time with their families, they're on the road representing the college and ministering to churches like us. And I'm very thankful that they would be willing to sacrifice that time away and be here and be a blessing in our church. So make certain to go by and tell them thank you. And then always, good to have Dr. Rasmussen, his wife Susa here, and uh, two of the most gracious, hospitable people that you'll ever meet in your life. And I wish every one of you would have time to just spend significant time getting to know them. They've been here every year for the last several years. And, uh, but unfortunately, after services, they've got to be in Coleman by 3.30. That's three hours away, so they're going to move pretty quick. And, uh, but you will know this about Dr. R and his wife. They are two of the great servants of God you'll ever meet. And the students that we send to West Coast Baptist College, and they will serve them, they will help them, they will encourage them, they will have them to their house, and they will minister to them in every possible way. And our students are not just a number there, they mean something to them, and I can't be more grateful for the investment they make into our young people that we send there. It's a joy to have him here preaching for us today, and so we'll have our offering at this time, and then when the offering is over, we'll have a couple more songs, and then Dr. Art, you come and preach. Father, thank you so very much for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for the guests that you sent us today. Uh, Lord, what a special thing that on a cold day like today, and uh, that they would be willing to come out and be a part of these services. Pray that you'd bless them for that. Thank you for every church member, every other uh, person that is here. I pray that you'd use these services to bring glory to your name, and, and Lord, to help us and encourage us and give us what we need to be the servants of Christ that we need to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you. 
words to me Red letters on a page Just something people say Till it brought me to my knees Those words in John 3, 16 For God so loved the world He gave Gave His only Son away Away to save Sad is 
I'm so glad the blood of Jesus speaks for me. Amen. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It's an honor, a great, great honor to be here at Bethany once again. I appreciate your pastor and his wife. Consider them personal friends. We have two young men from the church here who are at the college who have a good testimony and uh, have honored the Lord with being there at the college, and I appreciate both of them. Uh, like Keith, I'm a PK. My wife's a PK, and I like it when PKs have a good testimony, and he certainly has done that. Uh, if you are here for the first time today, I am sorry, honestly, that you don't get to hear Pastor Preston. He is a tremendous preacher, and he handles the Word of God well. And you folks here are blessed to have him. I, I recommend him places. I want to share something with you. Um, a man who's been in ministry 40 years texted me on Friday night, and here's what he said. He didn't know his name, but he knew I was preaching here because Pastor mentioned I'd be here Sunday. He said, the speaker from Lubbock... I know you're there tomorrow, so this is yesterday, has been a huge blessing. Great messages, and the Lord has really used him to reach our young people's hearts. Lots of decisions. He really connected, God knew. So when you share your pastor, just realize he's being used in other places. He's been used at our college. Uh, after he preached for us, I recommend him to my home church, where he, pre he preached there last Wednesday night before he spoke at the tea camp. And uh, so if you're visiting here, if I were anywhere near here, I would go here, and I like Brother David most of the time, and uh, <laughs> I love his attitude, I love his wife's spirit. Uh, his boys were at the Texas Tech game last night that they won. Did you get to go to that last night? Did you? They won by one point, so I bet they came home wired up and excited, and I know this is Texas Tech town. I have a Texas Tech Yeti cup your pastor gave me three years ago that I'm not exaggerating. I've used it hundreds of times. I take, I've got it on the road with me now, and I make tea in my own hotel room at night. I'll make it real dark, I'll steep it, I'll put it in the fridge, then I'll pour it in the Yeti cup, fill it up with ice, put more water in, I've got my own stevia, I'm good. And it reminds me to pray for Brother Preston, and his dad's a good friend of mine as well. I actually sent a copy of that text to his father, I thought that would be an encouragement to him. Well, thank you for being here today. I know it's cold out there. My soul is a cold out there. Uh, I did send a picture to several friends in California. I said, be thankful you're in Lancaster. Uh, it's nine degrees in Lubbock today, so, uh, but... I love Texas. You say, what do you love about Texas? Well, I've got a lot of good friends, a lot of good preacher friends here, and a lot of great churches in Texas. That's number one. Number two, I like the gas prices in Texas. <laughs> I have a Chevy Silverado that I filled up on Saturday before I flew out on Tuesday. I paid $5.39 a gallon for regular. I like the gas prices here. I like no state income tax. I like the governor. I would love to trade governors with you. We call our governor, Governor Nuisance, okay? So, <laughs> unbelievable. By the way, I like what he's doing at the border right now. I better be careful what I say, but I like what he's doing. I like the food in Texas. Now, I did have a little problem about three or four years ago, partially due to your pastor. No, I was here 24 days, and 23 out of 24 nights, I had either fajitas or barbecue or steak. And I got gout in my knee, okay? So, <laughs> my doctor said, it's okay to eat beef, but not every day, all right? So... I've been a little more careful since that time, but just so glad to be here. And I want to share something with you this morning. I've been preaching chapel about a week or so after school starts. I was thinking about 
freight preaching to students, but I'm going to use it on you first, okay? And I want to use it in my life even before that because I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject of staying on course, staying on course. By the way, you're on course by being in church this morning. Kudos to you. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the matter of some is. Thank you for obeying God on a day when it's more difficult to do that, right? Lots of people, well, hopefully that's still been at 1130. God bless them, all right? But uh, stay at home, so it's too cold out there. Um, I'll tell you one of the statements I tell students. We're either making progress or we're making excuses. You're at church, you're making progress. So I commend you with that. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to share a lot of verses with you today because what I say today, this is not what I think. It's what the Word of God says on how do we stay on course in 2024. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 17 says this, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. I'm 66 years of age. I've been in full-time ministry. I'm finishing my 45th year. I'd like to go full-time to 50. That would take me to 71. I'm not going to stop then. I still want to travel and preach sort of like uh, pastor's dad does. Uh, I have a lot of opportunities, still want to write and try to accomplish things for the cause of Christ. But I want to keep on keeping on. I want to occupy while I can. God tells us to occupy. God tells us to redeem the time. But can I tell you, friends, we can mean well and get off course. It's really easy to do. I have two daughters. Their names are Amy and Elisa. They're together right now in Thailand. They are both massive mercy givers. One is a missionary. She's been in Thailand for about 11 or 12 years now. The other one uh, works for a Christian camp and has a nonprofit. She's the head of a 501c3 called Garden 58 after Isaiah 58. And they help public school students. They help women just getting out of prison. Uh, it's an amazing story. She told me, she said, well, I'm going to pray we get a house for these people to keep them away from their friends. And I'm going, you know, her, her salary for the nonprofit is $1,500 a month. So she's, she's got deep pockets. And... Uh, I said, Amy, I thought that was a rather big goal. And she said, she called me and she said, Dad, somebody gave us $50,000 a house. I'm like, well, that's great, but you know, it's, then later on, somebody else gave him 50. And then she called me and she says, Dad, I shared my burden with a couple. And they just bought a house for the ministry for $500,000. It's a miracle. By the way, God provides. Where he guides, he provides. That's a blessing. But they're both mercy givers. And uh, by the way, one of the things about the Lord Jesus Christ, it says he went about doing good. And by the way, if you do as much as give you a cup of cold water in my name, you've done it unto me. Uh, I don't give money to homeless people. Ever see folks in the corner? We see a lot of them. But we give them something every time. We give them a bottle of water, a gospel track, and we usually have a bag of treats that we haven't eaten called the homeless bag. Give them, give them something to eat, you know, healthy, like a granola bar. We keep the chocolate chip cookies for ourselves, okay? <laughs> and uh, although one time last year they gave away a full unopened can of Pringles, I'm going, I don't even eat potato chips. But I'm going, the Pringles, Pringles, you know. But we want to do something for them. We want to be mercy givers. Well, one, one Easter break, spring break, at our college, we don't have it anymore. We have a longer Christmas break now. They asked me if they could go to Mexico and help at a children's home. They're going to record a bunch of music that they could play to sing for them, that type of thing, and help at home. And I'm going, okay, if that's what you want to do with your spring break. So they got in the car, and they got on the freeway, and I believe it was... Uh, the five, and they headed off for Mexico. And they called me up. They said, Dad, I'm not sure we're going the right way. They were nearing Bakersfield. <laughs> They'd gone north instead of south. <laughs> Just that one little turn took them in the wrong direction. So I'm going to share some things that I believe will help you to avoid cataclysmic failures. I'll give you the illustration. I think you remember we close today about just a little, a little change that caused a great fall. Little things. Song of Solomon 2. The little foxes spoil the vines. Remember that. But before we do that, let's ask God to help us these next 20 or 25 minutes. Lord, it's an honor to be here. Uh, just good to be with friends like the Prestons and others that we've met in the past. Lord, it's my desire, my desire to be a help and a blessing today. And I really believe that these truths from your word, if practiced, will help us to stay on course in the new year. Lord, it's my prayer that my wife and I will stay on course, our children will stay on course, college students will stay on course, and 
Well, this is the first time I preach this message here. I pray that each listener will stay on course as well. Please, please help us, Lord, to desire to stay on course in the new year. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you write little notes down, maybe on your bulletin or the back of an offering envelope, make sure to put your offering in, uh, you might want to remember these. And I'm going to give you a lot of verses to go with them. And we're going to move quickly here this morning because I know that all good messages are supposed to have three points. When I first started preaching 45, 46 years ago, I thought, well, seven's the number of perfection, so I'll do seven points. Well, that was wrong. Well, I will tell you this, that I have a lot of points here today. In fact, I have eight points, all right? And I'm going to move quickly, but how do we stay on course? Number one, we stay on course when you stay faithful in your Bible reading. I touched on this in Sunday school, Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Psalm 1, verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved to the God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. One of the great Christians was a man named George Mueller from Bristol, England. He had amazing, amazing ministry, a faith-based ministry. He said this, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. That's an amazing statement. So how important is the Bible to us? I'm a big believer. No Bible, no breakfast. I tell students, choose the Bible over your bed. I got a text the other day. It was a blessing to me. A man who's pastor many years, he sent me a picture in his Bible. He said, I started reading my Bible through every day, every day and then every year when I was in your class. He goes, I just finished it this time for the 24th time. That made my day, all right? Uh, it's something everybody can, you don't have to go to college to read your Bible through it a year. We need to make it important. Helen Keller said this, unless we form the habit of going to the Bible in bright moments as well as in trouble, we cannot fully respond to its consolations because we lack equilibrium between light and darkness. What a very simple thought. I read about a World's Fair in New York City that has a time capsule that's supposed to be buried for 5,000 years. I think the Lord will come back long before that. In the middle of the things placed in the time capsule, they put a Bible. They knew something, did they? They knew it was important. So can I challenge you in this new year? In the middle of your schedule, whether it's your week, your month, your year, make sure that God's Word is there. It will help you to stay on course. Secondly, this morning, if you're going to stay on course, you must stay faithful in prayer. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. Jeremiah 33, 3 is one of my favorite verses. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God says, call unto him. John and Rice wrote a good book called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. We have to ask. If my wife wants something, Susan, if you'll stand up, you would for just a moment. This is my wife, Susan. We've been married for almost 43 years, be 43 years in May. If she wants something, if she asks for it, she's going to probably get it. 99% of the time, all right? I did have to tell her no. I had a chance to go on a journey to Paul Cruz, but I was booked to speak somewhere else, and I told him no. She's not quite got over that yet. She's, that was her, on her bucket list. But uh, usually I say yes to her on everything. Uh, I'm a big believer, man. Proverbs 37, 37, happy wife, happy life. Okay, so remember that. That's not really a verse. But, but we got to stay faithful in prayer. Can I tell you the most challenging verse on that? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. Pray without what? Ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Have a spirit of prayer. Do we pray about everything? Very challenging book I read a number of years ago. It was a two-volume book called The History of the Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford. Those early pilgrims, one thing I'm going to tell you, by the way, they were the only ones to pay back the people loaned the money to get here. They're the ones who started Thanksgiving, all right? Even though half the people died the first year, those folks prayed about everything. It was convicting constantly praying. They were people of prayer. No wonder God blessed them. So the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James chapter 5, verse 16. It counts for something. It works if we work it. Have you ever heard that before? It'll work if you work it. 
I exercise, try to exercise every day, not it depends on our schedule, but most days I exercise and uh, I prefer an elliptical, sometimes I go outside and walk a number of miles. And uh, I know this, I feel better after I exercise. I only got 45 minutes in, today we may get to a place earlier, if we're in a hotel, I'll do that. If it's outside, I usually, depends how cold it is, I'll go to a track and read a book and walk around the track. Uh, sometimes climb the steps of the track, try not to fall down them. And uh, I just know that's good for me. By the way, there's five critical elements of the Christian life. If you get this, it could change your life. Three of them are pretty easy for me. It's easy for me to go to church. Quite honestly, it's easy for me to read my Bible because it's a habit. It's easy for me to tithe. By the way, God blesses givers. If you're not a tither, start today. We're commanded to give tithes and offerings. God says, you robbed me in Malachi. We're going to be robbed in tithes and offerings. I get paid on Wednesdays. I tithe on Wednesday. You say it's not the first day of the week. I think God will forgive me for being a few days early. I just, if it's in my check account, I text to give. Boom. But there's two more parts of the Christian life that are a little bit harder for me. Prayer and witnessing. Their work. Got to work at it. And the way to accomplish those things is to schedule time for them. One of the statements college students here say, that which gets scheduled gets done. I schedule time for my devotions. When I'm home, it's in the same chair for the same Bible, the same time, the same place every day. I mark that Bible where I'm at, the Old Testament, New Testament, Proverbs. It just, that's where I go, right? I schedule time for prayer meetings. I schedule time for soul winning. I schedule time for exercise. I try to time my exercise around, usually around watching a game or something like that. I've got a workout room with an elliptical and a life cycle in there, and maybe I'll get the second half of a ball game. Kind of works out throughout the right time to get my hour in. Schedule it. By the way, some time is no time. Right? So I challenge you, stay faithful in prayer. George Herbert said, prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. My wife and I try to pray together every night before we go to sleep. I may stay up and read or study later that, but we pray together. It's a good thing to do. Charles Spurgeon, an amazing man known as the Prince of Preachers, said this, prayer is not a hard requirement. It is the natural duty of a creature to its creator. The simplest homage that human need can pay to divine liberality. He's right. Corey Tinboom, how many ever heard the name of Corey Tinboom from World War II? This, this is a great quote. Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? When I read that the first time, I said, wow. I've never used a spare tire in my truck. I've had it for two, three years. Praise God. All right. Of course, I used it to be AAA, not me who did it. All right. I don't ever think about that spare tire. I'm afraid that sometimes we don't think much about prayer. If Jesus took time to pray, how much more should we take time to pray? Number three, you should stay faithful and stay on course when you stay faithful to the things you know you should do. The Bible says you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be kid. Can I challenge you, my friend? I wrote a series of Sunday school lessons called Salt and Light. It's the best-selling series I ever did. I think partially because the cover is really cool. It's got a light bulb that's lit and a salt shaker that's spilling. It's lime green. I would never pick that color, but it, it sells a lot. It's the metaphors of the Lord Jesus Christ. How would it be a farmer? How would it be a soldier? These different things. But it's amazing in each of those things how the order to be salt and light. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do your neighbors know who your Jesus is? Do your coworkers know who your Jesus is? Does your family truly know who your Jesus is? One lady said, I am only one, but I, still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Oh, by the way, that was said by a lady who was blind, deaf, and dumb. Helen Keller. Think she had an excuse not to do anything? I would say so. Eliza Hewitt, who wrote When We All Get to Heaven, said, Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. It will be worth it all if we see Jesus. Let's work for the night is coming. Night cometh when no man can work. Jesus prayed for laborers the harvest field. Pray ye there for the Lord of the harvest that he'll send for laborers in the harvest field. We are the laborers. We're co-laborers together with Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. So we're going to stay on course. We stay faithful to do the things we need to do. Thank you for teaching Sunday school and ushering and singing. 
And working in the nursery, let's stay faithful. Number four, we stay in course when we stay faithful in serving. Have you ever noticed those really comfortable chairs? Let me see, who makes those chairs? You can recline in them and it pops up to your feet. What are those called? Lazy boys, that's right. Have you ever noticed those are not called worker boy chairs? <laughs> Folks, we got to get up and get going. We got to get up and get going. It was 1996, Rob Hall was dying on the top of Mount Everest. He was leading a group called Mountain Madness New Zealand. It was one of the most disastrous days in the history of Everest. And he was freezing to death. He couldn't get up. His wife was pregnant with her eight-month-old child in, in, her, in her womb. And she was talking to him. He says, Rob, you have to get up. You've got to get up. And he said this. I heard the recording. He says, can't somebody come and help me? He's still there today. He's still there today. I wonder how many are in Lubbock saying, won't someone come and help me? I've got pictures in my Bible and that people mean a lot to me. Some of these people are in heaven today. This was taken a number of years ago. There's Dr. Mrs. Seth. She's in heaven today. There's Dave and Terry Payne. I led Dave and Terry to the Lord. Let her, let her mother to the Lord. My daughter led their daughter to the Lord. They're dear to me. What was interesting, Dave was a biomedical engineer, extremely well to do, and he lived 27 miles from the church. And Jerry Furso gave me the address. I wasn't happy. 54 mile round trip. But I knew I should go see him. He'd visited one time. I grabbed my son. I said, let's go make this visit. I said, it's probably on a dirt road and double wide with wild dogs. I had a good attitude. Sure enough, it was on a dirt road. It wasn't a double wide. No wild dogs, though. I called. I said, we got to call and see if he's there before I go all the way there and waste all the time. And I said, no, we need to at least go and leave a track in the door so we know somebody cares. No answer. I said, let's go. Blasted out there 27 miles away. I had to do something for a pastor at noon, so I was pressing on my mind. It was fellowship at his house with the basketball team at that time. Got there. It was hard to find the house. It's a five-acre lots out there. 165th East at Avenue D. And uh, you would understand how far that is. Finally got there. I told my son to stay in the truck. I got a track out. I'm walking, knocked on the door. I'm right in the track. The door opened. It about scared me to death. I thought nobody was there. I waved my son. He said, I said, I'm from Lancaster Baptist Church. I'll never forget what he said, folks. He said, I was hoping somebody would come. I was hoping somebody would come. We walked in. The first thing I noticed, it wasn't like any double white. I'd been, there were trophies from Africa everywhere, like stacked. I go, uh, you've been to Africa? He said, yeah, I've been to four safaris the last 10 years. <laughs> and then I kind of put my foot in my mouth. I said, well, why do you live here? He goes, my wife's got horses. There you go. So I said, okay. Well, Dave got saved that day. Very unusual, first time like that, he got saved. It took about three months later before his wife got saved, and later on the next year, his mother, mother-in-law got saved. Can I tell you this, friends? It's worth it to serve Jesus. I write him every month of my life. He retired, bought a farm in, in Tennessee, in Athens. I've been at his church one time and uh, preached there. But he's my son of the faith. He's dear to me. I'm sure glad I made that drive that day. Maybe she's taking some cookies or brownies to a neighbor. You say, you don't know what my neighbor's like. Well, you don't know what my neighbor's like. I've got two lesbians who live next door to me. We both work at Edwards Air Force Base. But the people next door to us finally did come and finally did get saved. We need to be faithful. Can I give you a little statement? We were saved to serve and not to sit. We were saved to serve and not to sit. One songwriter understood this. Not to be carried through the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others toil to win the prize and sail to bloody seas. Toil means to work. Satan lies and says, the church doesn't need you. I've got a message I wrote in the last year called, Are You an Owner or a Renter? <laughs> Owners handle things differently than renters. I know, I've got a couple of rental properties. I close the message with a clip of Shohei Otani. If you're a sports fan, you know his name. He just signed a contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers for 10 years for $700 million. But I have a clip of him walking through the dugout, picking up trash on the floor and throwing it away. Running to first base, picking up a piece of trash on the field, putting it in his pocket. 
He's an owner, not a renter. Would people say about you that you're an owner at Bethany Baptist Church or just a renter? I believe God wants us, shall we say, to be all in and to really seek to be faithful in serving. You stay on course when you're faithful in being kind and not being angry. Everybody likes kind people. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 24, make no friendship with an angry man. The only counsel I give our cedars, I have a class, I teach all the freshmen when they come and all the seeds are good. I said, don't go to work for an angry man. He won't be happy and you won't be happy. So God will lead you, but don't go to work for an angry man. He says, don't make even friendship with him, much less become employed by him. He said, find out. He said, don't worry about finding it. He says, God will, God will provide your needs. You don't need to be miserable. The Bible says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down without walls, Proverbs 25, verse 28. Let's let people see the peace of God in our heart. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. I just read that. <laughs> I love this verse. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace of they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I had a man tell me, older than me, he said, I can't help it, I'm just cheap low top. I said, don't confess your sins to me. But people ought to see the peace of God in our life. Do not say, I can't help having a bad temper. You can't help it. You must help it, said Charles Spurgeon. Pray to God to help you overcome it at once, for either you must kill it or it will kill you. You cannot carry a bad temper into heaven. Benjamin Franklin said, anger is never without a reason, but seldom with a good one. God doesn't want us to be angry without cause. A lady once came to Billy Sunday and she said, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper. I blow up and it's all over. Sunday thought for a second. He said, so does a shotgun. But look at the damage it leaves behind. Getting angry can sometimes be like leaping in a wonderfully responsive sports car, roaring off, but we're not realizing it has no brakes. Don't do that. Let the peace of God reign in your heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. A great peace of them which love thy law. If you're listening well this morning, just two more will be done. Number six, you stay on course when you stay faithful and forgiving. Are you quick to forgive? Can I give you a little thought for the new year? People say, what would Jesus do? How many have ever heard that before? WWJD. You may see it on a lanyard, a bracelet, a Bible cover. I'm going to tell you what Jesus would do. Number one, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Number one. Number two, he came to forgive. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Number three, he came to give. He came to give himself a ransom for many. And fourthly, he went about doing good. What a model for us today. Let's look at Jesus. What would he do? He'd try to see people get saved. He'd give. He'd forgive. And he went about doing good. No wonder people came to him. Yes, some came for the foods. Some came to see the miracles. But he also said, no man spake as this man spake. He was different. I challenge you. Stay faithful and forgiving. Peter said, Lord, how often should we forgive? Seven times? You said, no, 70 times seven. No one's ever wronged me 490 times. So just keep having a forgiving spirit. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive, forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If we're like the Lord, we'll forgive. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He forgives us. Oh, what a Savior. In the Boxer Rebellion in China, a horrible time for believers. Christians prayed for those who killed believers. They prayed for those who were killing believers. One of them came to the Christians and said, your religion is real. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I like this quote. I don't know who said it. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. I've often said in couples retreats, if we forgive, don't bring it up again. Don't keep picking off a scab. Paul said, forgetting those things which are past, looking forward to those things which are before, the prize of the high calling. Put it behind you, go on. 
Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Amen. And God wants to bless you, wants to use you. You stay on course when you stay faithful and trust in God. There's more than 14,000 promises in the Bible. And God's never broken one of them. Right. You can trust him. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said, God, said the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I think of the promise of my God to supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God promises supply for you. Just trust him. I don't know about you, but I have found it's easy to worry. Does anyone like to worry here a little bit? My mom was a worrier. You know the Bible says three times in one psalm and six verses, fret not. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He will take care of you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What a great promise. And finally, I close with this this morning. You will stay on course when you choose a sanctified life over a sinful life. When you choose a sanctified life. The word sanctified means to be set apart. Instead of using I'm human as an excuse to walk in the flesh, why don't we say I'm saved and use that as a reason to walk in the Spirit? Let me say that again. Instead of saying I'm just human, that's why I walk in the flesh, let's say I'm saved so we can walk in the Spirit. He walks in us. He wants to guide us. He wants to work in us and through us. Philippians 2 verse 13. Please remember that. When we sin, we're deliberately getting off course. We're choosing. The greatest fiction book in Christendom history is called Pilgrim's Progress. Best-selling Christian book of all time outside the Bible. The second best-selling book is called In His Steps by Charles Sheldon, which really is thematically very similar. He talks about a believer called Pilgrim or Christian. And he's going uphill towards a celestial city whose ruler and builder is God. He realizes that there's times where he could go off. It looks like, oh, here's a nice meadow, and it's downhill. It's always easier going downhill than it is going uphill. When he stays on course, he's drawing close to the Lord Jesus Christ. I fly a lot. I don't know how many miles I've flown. I know it's well over 2 million miles, 1.7 million just on American Airlines alone. And when you fly, you often fly at anywhere between 27,000 and 35,000 feet high. You can't see the ground up there. But if you ever notice out in the fields, there'll be these little white objects. They're called vortac, V-O-R-T-A-C. They sit a beam up there. And if the plane gets outside of that beam, it beeps in the cockpit to keep them on the right path. You see, a one degree variation, one degree, flying from Los Angeles to New York, you'll miss New York City by 20 miles. And we think, well, just I'm a little bit off course. I love the phrase in the Bible, consider the end of a thing. In World War II, a lot of the Hollywood stars were involved in raising money for the war effort. This was largely done by selling war bonds. One of the most famous actresses at that time was a lady by the name of Carol Lombard, beautiful lady, famous movie star. She was married to Clark Gable. She finished raising $2 million dollars in Kansas City. She was flying TWA Flight 3 from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Transcontinental route, 22 people on board, including Carol Lombard, her mother, and her agent. She'd just done a good thing, sold $2 million of the war bonds. 15 minutes after takeoff, the plane crashed into a mountain, and everybody died. They said, what happened? It was a clear day. And they said the pilot didn't use the navigational tools that were available to him. I'm afraid that sometimes we see Christians who crash because they don't use the navigational tools God's given them. The Word of God, prayer, church. Why don't we just decide as we go into this new year that we're going to do everything in our power to stay on course? Today, if you're a first-time visitor, and if perchance you do not know for sure you're on your way to heaven, that is the singular most important decision you'll ever make. I've made important decisions in my life. My second most important decision is who I married. Thirdly, probably to go to Bible college and change my life. But that pales into utter insignificance compared to choosing to trust Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior.
you haven't done that, in just a moment we'll have an invitation. I'm going to turn it over to the pastor. And when I do that, well, people here at the front, they could take just a few moments to show you for the Bible how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I pray you'll bless during this invitation time. I pray you'll work in hearts. If you're here today and you say, I know for sure I'm on my way to heaven, would you just raise your hand in testimony to that? Many hands raised. That's as I expected here this Sunday morning. For those of you who are believers, how many would say, Dr. Rasmussen, with God's help, I'm going to work at these things and do my best to stay on course in this new year. I'm going to work at those things. To read my Bible, to pray, to serve, to be forgiving, to be kind. I'm going to work at having those things in my life. I'm going to ask God to help me. If you'd say that, would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. I'm going to, my hand's raised as well. I'm going to ask one more question. I wonder, is there someone here today, maybe a visitor, maybe someone who's newer to the church? You say, I don't know for sure I'm on my way to heaven. I'm not positive about that. Would you please pray for me this morning? If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, I will not come to you or embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone like that today? You say, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you raise your hand at this time? Anybody like that at all? I'm looking. Anybody like that at all? If you don't know, please don't leave without settling that today. It's the most important decision you could ever make. Lord, I pray you bless during this invitation time. I pray you speak to hearts. I pray, Lord, maybe some will just rededicate themselves this new year to be in the way, to walk in the way, to do the things of the way. I think about how the early church people, the early believers back in Jerusalem were called people of the way. I pray that we'll be in the way. And Lord, I pray if there's someone who doesn't know you, we'll come to know you. The hands bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask you to stand your feet if you would, please. And I'll hand this over to Pastor this time. We'll have a time of invitation. God spoke to your heart. I invite you to come and respond. If you are here, even if you didn't raise your hand and you don't know for certain you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, and David, our associate pastor, is here. He'd like to guide you to someone who could answer the questions on how you can know for certain you'd spend eternity in heaven. Brandon, you lead us in a song. As he does, you respond today.
much this week from uh, Brother Monty and uh, one evening, and uh, he said, just wanted you to know that Mackenzie just accepted Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. Mackenzie grew up in this church. Evidently, he's been struggling with it for a long time. And, uh, and so I put that out on, on the group thread for all the staff to see, and it didn't take but just a few moments, and Miss Cowley responded. She said, I just got off the phone. She said, she got it. Like, she's preaching at me. She got it. And uh, so I, I love that. Praying for Miss Pam now that she'll get saved. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're so thankful for that. And we're going to be baptizing Mackenzie and tonight. And, uh, and I, I want to make this clear. And I'm not ca- trying to cause anybody, anybody to doubt their salvation. But you can be raised in a church, come up through the nursery, I mean, grow up through the youth department and still not know for certain. And that's no way to live. Aren't you glad you got it settled? So will you be. If, if you're not 100% certain, there's a table in the back and it has several things on it. I'm going to ask Dr. R to come for just a moment and just give you a little bit of information about what's back there and encourage you to stop by that table and pick some things up. Thank you, Pastor. So, do your starts. It's a good time to start some good habits with reading as well. I'm going to mention a few books very quickly. Uh, we have a number of CDs back there. We maintain COVID pricing on CDs. $10 a piece, you buy four, you get one free. I think mom and music are the thermostats of the home. I think if mom's got a good spirit, if the music's right, it helps the spirit of the home to be right. A great quartet CD called the Heritage Quartet. Our newest CD, didn't have this when we were here last year, called Endless Praise. It's got a 120 voice choir, about four different groups set here, a lot of great songs as well. If you like the old hymns, great songs of faith. This is an instrumental CD. Songs like Anne Can It Be, How Great Thou Art, The Old Rugged Cross, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, uh, It Is Well With My Soul, Blessed Assurance, and others. Uh, a few books, Dr. Arby Willett, and if you have a prayer list, I'd encourage you to put him on there. He had to have his voice box removed due to cancer. Uh, he just spoke for the first time in about three months with a metal nebulizer at a funeral the other day. He said he sounded like R2-D2, but uh, he wants to preach again. I'm praying that he'll be able to do that. This is a book called The Principle of Life, 30 Biblical Principles to Guide Your Life. It'd be a great book to read in the new year. Uh, then, uh, ladies, we have two devotionals back there by Mrs. Lorianne Gibbs, a lady who truly walks with the Lord. They're beautiful books. They're made to sell for 20. We sell for 12 or two for 20. You get both the different books, and it'd be a great book to start reading on right now. We have three large devotionals back there. They're 365-day devotionals. This one is called Revival Today by Dr. Getch. Everyone tells a story of a revival either in a, a church or an evangelist or a missionary. And you know what's great about it? The same God that did that wants to work in and through us today. You might enjoy that. There's one called The Word of the Wise, all from Proverbs. Proverbs is God's wisdom book. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all that getting and understanding. A brand new book we just came out with, I gave this both to Brother David and a pastor. It's called The Christian Counselor's Guidebook. A biblical resource of Christian. If you deal with people at all, I would encourage you to get this book. It's selling like hotcakes, and I'll tell you why. We have 50 categories. I'll just read a few of them quickly. A through Z, abortion, abuse, addiction, alcohol, anger, anxiety, stress, apathy, assurance of salvation, authority, bitterness, complaining, conflict, contentment, cursing. I just took you A through C, and it goes all the way down through wasting time, witnessing, waiting on God. Uh, a really helpful, helpful thing if you are in leadership at all and deal with counseling people. And then finally, a book I wrote, if you have children in your home, it's called The 101 Tips for Teaching. Teaching is a transfer, it's a truth. Uh, one of the tips is the goal is progress, not perfection. If you're a Sunday school teacher, this might be a help to you. Just read one page a day, and I think it'll help you be more effective with you. And finally, a little book called Victory by Dr. Jim Shetler, a seven-step strategy to resisting temptation and overcoming sin. Every parent ought to get this. It sells for seven. I sell for five. I want to get it out. And I heard this preached 30 years ago. And I don't copy people's outlines very often. I said, that's an easy outline. I'm going to copy that. I went up to Dr. Shetler. I said, you preach that anywhere? He said, yeah, three or 400 churches. I didn't copy it. Okay, but as soon as he came to work for us 10 years ago, I put it to print. This might be a great help. And again, if you have any questions about the college, parents, if you're interested in taking some online classes, uh, please feel free to see me. We certainly have time to talk to you. Thank you for listening so well today. All right, we're going to see some announcements at this time, and then Brother Fowler is going to come close this in prayer. Hope to see all of you back in God's house this evening. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope our services have been a blessing and a help to you. 
If this is your first time, stop by one of the tables in the lobby, fill out a card, and pick up the gift we have for you. If you have any questions about our church, our staff will be glad to talk with you after the service. We hope you'll join us again soon. There is a ladies activity on Monday, January 22nd at 7 p.m. in the two-story building. Please bring your favorite games and your favorite finger foods. This is a great time to fellowship, be encouraged, and get to know other ladies in our church. This year, we will have four youth rallies that we will co-host with Southwest Baptist Church in Midland, Arden Road Baptist Church in Amarillo, and Tabernacle Baptist Church in Roswell. Our first rally will be in Midland, Texas on Saturday, January 27th. We highly encourage all of our teens to make a point to go. Our missions revival will be here before you know it. This year, we are privileged to have Pastor Wayne Hardy preaching for us as well as several missionary families joining us. Let's start praying now that God will work in our hearts and continue to strengthen our mission program. The Men's Advance in Roswell, New Mexico is coming up March 8th and 9th. This is the first year for this conference hosted by Pastor Michael Kaufman at Tabernacle Baptist Church. This year, Pastor Michael Jones and Pastor Aaron Denson will be preaching. This conference will be closer and it is our desire that we will have a lot more men that will be able to go. We hope you will consider joining our men on this trip. The cost is $45 plus hotel. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. If you have any questions, please talk to Brother David. There will be no choir practice this afternoon for adults or children. If you are interested in participating in music ministry, then be sure to be here when we resume practice next Sunday at 345. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you back here at 5 o'clock.